Good morning. I'd like to call the special meeting of the Board of Public Utilities for the City of Santa Rosa to order. If we may have a roll call, please. Here. 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 Statements of abstention by board members. Board member Mullen. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, j just close uh, for the record uh, that I was contacted uh, via my personal email, which I still haven't found out how somebody got my personal email since I've been seated on this body one week. Um, <laughs> but um, it was regarding um, a appeal that is apparently going to be coming before this body of a staff decision regarding a uh, private sewer connection on a rebuild on um, Brush Creek Road. And I have uh, neither responded to the uh, representative or done any follow-up with staff on this except to say that uh, I look forward to this item coming to the, to the board and reviewing all the information at the same time. So that's the extent of my contact. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Dowd. Uh, I suspect that the gentleman that uh, tried to get a hold of Board Member Mullen uh, did get a hold of me. He's a friend and acquaintance, uh, Tony Cabrera, uh, who's a friend and representing the owner of that property. He and I met to talk about the issue, so it, uh, divulging that ex parte communication. Board Member Badenford? I do. And I'm just going to interrupt. We, we can continue to do this, but I think we're going to duplicate the process at that time when the item is agendized. So it's up to the board members whether they want to go through this exercise again then and now, it's, but it's, it's not relevant to any of the items on the agenda today. So I would uh, just advise that it's not a requirement at this point. Thank you. Correct. Any other abstentions? Just for the record, I'm going to state that I did meet with Mr. Cabrera also because I may not be present at the meeting in June when this may be come before the board, so I have met with him also. All right, we have no study session. We have no minutes to approve. We'll move right to 5.1, staff briefing on the fire recovery activities. The, this, I'll just briefly uh, note, <clears throat> this is intended to provide part of an ongoing update to the board in regards to the issues and activities regarding the water quality issues that have arisen in Fountain Grove as a result of the fire. Um, specifically today, part of what we're interested in is some, um, if you have any feedback in terms of the messaging, and Ms. Burke may hit on some of the areas where there is some confusion this is a complex issue and still somewhat dynamic in terms of some of the messaging that had been coming from staff. So um, you're, you'll introduce the support that we have in the audience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Burke. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman Galvin and members of the board. And thank you, Director Hornstein, uh, for giving that overview of, of sort of what we're bringing today. Um, one of the challenges we've been faced with is um, this is a very technical and difficult problem. Um, as you all have heard before, it's unprecedented. So trying to move through the way to communicate um, with all of our customers, not only those that are within the advisory area, those that are surviving homes in the advisory area, those that have homes to be rebuilt in the surviving area, in the advisory area, those in the burn area outside of the advisory area, as well as communicating to the public at large about our water system and the safety and that the water is safe to drink. Um, there's a lot of variables and a lot of layers. Investigatory samples are different than regulatory samples and trying to explain all of this very technical information and data and investigation in a way that's easily consumable by the public and also communicating in a way that um, is frequent enough that they feel like they're getting 
enough information and being um, informed has been challenging. So we have been working on that quite a bit and I'd like to uh, particularly introduce Mark Milan with Data Instincts. I think a lot of you may know him. Um, he's really a recognized national expert on communications, especially uh, risk, risk management communications. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, working on a number of very complicated water supply projects um, throughout California, but also throughout um, the U.S. and internationally as well. So we're very um, lucky that uh, Data Instincts is a local firm right in our backyard, and we've worked with Data Instincts over the years on a number of projects. In particular, they were the outreach on the Geysers project, which was a very complicated uh, project as well to get through you know, a pipeline through a um, very expensive uh, area of this world. <laughs> so what we wanted to do today is um, provide an update on where we are with the investigation, but we're going to do it through sort of a um, condensed down version of sort of the new messaging that we're putting forward. This doesn't cover everything that we would normally be putting forth to folks, but we do want the boards to sort of feedback um, on, you know, any, any comments on that. Um, again, it's a condensed version, so we're still adding some additional information and, and things we wanted to cover, but we thought this would give you a flavor for where we're going, give you an update on the investigation. We'll incorporate any feedback you have. We'll also be bringing this to the council um, and, and working with them as well, as, as well as doing a number of other outreach in relation to our communication plans and starting to get this word and information out. So with that, um, we're gonna do a, just sort of a brief background and update on where we are and then talk about next steps in terms of rebuilding. Um, so let's get started. So as everyone knows, um, this is, has been an unprecedented um, issue. Um, once we realized that there was uh, contamination, in particular benzene has been the contaminant that has been over the MCL and is most indicative of the issue that we're dealing with. Um, we pulled together uh, regulatory agencies, so state, local, federal agencies, as well as um, national experts, a forensic chemist team, to really work with us to inform and develop an investigation, including a sampling plan, flushing plan, and looking at resolution. Since that time, um, it's been a few months, we've done extensive sampling, which I'll talk about in just a minute, and we have determined what the source of this issue is. Um, this was caused by the fire, um, in particular, melting and burning of plastics, particularly on the private side, but also some of our components in the water system, as well as smoke, soot, and ash from the fire was um, got into our water system and contaminated our system. So in some cases, it adhered to water service lines, um, such as copper service lines, and a water service line is the line from the main to the meter. In some cases, it absorbed into water service lines, like HTPE service lines or gaskets in valves, um, and is leaching back out into the water. As I mentioned, we've, we've done a lot to really understand this problem and really do a very thorough, methodical investigation. We have taken uh, over 4,000 water quality samples and we're probably closer to 4,500 at this point. Um, samples that we've been taking since November. And this map in particular shows you the extent of where we've taken all the sampling um, we have taken a we have sampled every single water service line within 500 feet of a burn structure. So, not only have we sampled extensively in the water quality advisory area, but we've also sampled extensively throughout the entire burn area, and then we're continuing to sample throughout the entire system to ensure that this area is where we see the contamination, and we're not seeing it anywhere else. In particular, this map also shows sort of the difference of how the contamination is acting. Um, in the advisory area, we are seeing 
contamination through the majority, if not all, of the water service lines, as well as we've seen um, from water quality samples that we've taken, contamination um, is in the water supply that's in that area, as well as components we have tested, whether it's been pieces of main or gaskets or service lines, we have seen contamination in some of the system and the appurtenances. Outside of the advisory area, we've only seen contamination in the water service lines to burned homes, so or burned properties. If so, I, sure. I wanted to just add one piece that um, from our investigation, there is so much that we've learned and we know. There still is stuff that we don't know um, and that we may never fully understand. And we do get questions, so specifically a question we do get, and we've really tried to understand this, is why is this area acting so distinct from the other areas? It did have, of course, similar from at least appearances, fire go through, um, as well as um, Similar, as far as we can tell, and I'll explain what I mean by that, in terms of pressure and water loss. Part of the challenge in trying to understand why this area may be so unique and what occurred is that, as you've heard from us, very shortly after the fires began, we lost power and we also lost um, our telemetry, our remote sensors that give us flow information, level information and in tanks, pressure information throughout the system. So it's been very, very difficult to try and piece together what occurred. Today when we're asked, what we, we do acknowledge we really don't know and we may never know and we speculate the current perhaps, but there may be others thinking is um, this is not a result of some different sort of materials of construction. That gets asked a lot. Um, and we really have not found what early on we thought a, a very distinct nature of the pressure and water loss in this area. We think it has to do with the timing of the pressure loss with the fire going through it. And what we mean by that is in some areas, perhaps, when the fire was initially hitting it, they still had pressure, which meant the lines that broke were able to flush out that initial contamination that was formed. And in this, but this is all speculative, in this area, perhaps we lost water as the fire in a different sort of timing of pressure versus fire that allowed that contamination to come down into the system. But at this point, on that issue and that I'm sharing that reflecting both there are things we don't still understand and also it is one question we have struggled with and are acknowledging because the lack of remote data we may never fully understand the and be able to provide clarity to that question great thank you um, so um, now that we have a thorough understanding from the investigation of what caused the contamination and where we found it, we're starting to uh, work on the path towards resolution. Um, and the recent information is really showing us some really good news. Um, outside of the advisory area where we've detected contamination in what we call first draw investigatory samples which are very conservative samples taking water that's been sitting in a service line at an uh, immediate sampling point and and seeing what those results are um, we've replaced those service lines and then we've resampled and we have found that that has removed the contamination so guided by that information that's happening outside the service area, and we are gonna begin looking at, and you'll be hearing on your next item, replacing the water service lines within the advisory area. One of the things that we have found is that the highest levels of contamination are in the water service lines. To protect and ensure that the remaining homes were getting the highest water quality possible and really 
separating out any possibility of um, connection to that contamination in the service lines, we did go through and isolate valves. In some cases, it's isolating service lines. In some cases, it's isolating whole courts to really limit any connection between the contaminated service lines and the 13 homes. And this graph, although I will say this is a graph that we're playing with, it's not the one that we're gonna use finally because there's some data that doesn't make a lot of sense and I'll explain that in a second. But in general, the trending that we're seeing is very good news. Since we did those isolations and continued to flush water and folks were moving water, these lines, which I know are kind of all over the place, um, show the results from the weekly samples that we're taking at the existing homes in the area. The top red line is one part per billion, and that's the maximum contaminant level, so anything below that is regulatory compliance. The dotted red line is at 0.5 parts per billion, and that's the reporting limit. Anything that's below that, um, from a regulatory perspective, is non-detect. But because we can still see underneath 0.5, um, where we can see, we are doing um, uh, putting those results available so that folks can be aware. But those are really trace levels of benzene. And so what this graph does show you is that um, prior to January, prior to the isolations that we did in the advisory area, we were seeing sample results that were above the MCL. Since we've done the isolations and have um, continued to move water and folks are, are using water as well, um, it's really good news. The data is trending in such a way that it's showing that the contamination has been either, in a lot of cases, we're seeing non-detects and in some cases we're seeing very low levels. One of the things I did want to point out is um, you may see this little weird yellow line. I don't even know what color it is in here. Uh, it's supposed to be yellow where you kind of see this dot up there and dot down below. Uh, one of the things we're still working through is data management. And in some cases, folks have asked us to take samples on the private side, so take samples from their sinks or from their hoses the, of the 13 that are in the advisory area, and we've done that. So in particular, you'll see this is actually uh, a result from a hose bib on the person's property. Um, taking it as a first draw for something that they haven't used for months on end, and it was still below the reporting limit, technically non-detect, and then letting water flow through and retaking it, and it became um, truly non-detect. So, um, again, we're, we're still playing with this graph. It's not the graph we're going to use, but I did want to kind of point out why it has some weird anomalies in there. Um, but we are going to be trending data over time and starting to show that to folks so they can understand that really the water quality that we're seeing in the advisory area um, is really showing good news. So with that data, um, with the results that we're seeing outside of the service area, uh, we will be replacing all the service lines within the advisory area to ensure that the surviving homes that remain there are really getting the most protection possible. We will be installing temporary activated carbon filters um, for those folks uh, so that we can then unisolate within the advisory area and return the system to normal operations and continue to sample and understand if the service line replacement solves the issue or if there's other things we need to do. In addition, um, as folks are rebuilding, should anyone be ready to connect for occupancy prior to us um, lifting the advisory, we will also, as needed, install activated carbon systems for folks for occupancy. And then we're going to continue to sample, we're going to continue to flush, we're going to continue to implement our plans. And the data will guide us. The data is going to help us understand what's working, where there may be additional issues. So we'll really understand once we replace the service lines, it really gives us 350 more data points that we can look at to see, did this resolve the issue or are there other things we need to look at? There may be areas, isolated areas, where we need to do some targeted replacement. And it may be based on the data 
that we may have to look at full replacement. So we're still, all options are on the table, but really want to recognize that the data is really gonna guide sort of staff recommendations on how we should move forward. This is um, to share, we are getting some questions as we talk about the activated carbon systems. Is this gonna turn into a permanent solution? Or is the city trying to save money with this phased approach? It's not dominating. The, the meetings we're having with community folks, it's very interesting and you see different perspectives. But one is that concern and we're trying to be very clear. These activated carbon systems are temporary. From a regulatory context, they wouldn't be allowed anyway. And the full replacement is not off the table. This is just a step to fully understand the right fix. But some of the direction we're taking is leading to those sorts of questions that are driving a lot of thought and support of how we frame our messaging and context of those concerns. So um, the first phase of starting to restore the system in the advisory area is the replacement of all service lines to the 352 parcels that are in the advisory area. There's also some blow offs that um, we've seen some contamination so we'd replace those as well. Um, you'll be talking about that at your next item. Um, and then it will allow us to unisolate, return the water system to normal operations, continue to flush, continue to monitor, and see what the data shows us, and then determine if, uh, if or what next steps would need to be. We are also continuing to work with both um, FEMA and Cal OES to really look at all funding options. Um, so. We're looking at all opportunities for funding and also making sure that um, what we're doing and everything we're looking at is ensuring us to be in the best position to try and get reimbursement from FEMA. Um, but we're also doing what we need to do to ensure that we're restoring water quality. We've also received some questions um, about some temporary water supplies, in particular for construction and for irrigation. In some cases, in the water quality advisory area, um, landscapes have survived and folks are interested in irrigating those landscapes. And so we have uh, recently developed a path forward for that and we will be sharing that information very soon, but it will allow us with um, appropriate education, signage, and um, acknowledgement agreement to set meters for those that want them either for landscapes or for construction at their properties. Um, be very clear that this is not for drinking and not for any other purpose than in either irrigation or construction purposes. So in terms of next steps, um, we're continuing to refine the message, continuing to work on our communications plan and have a, a number of different um, ways we're going to be get, getting the word out. We're going to continue to use our social media, our, our website, our emails. We're doing presentations. Last night we actually had a meeting with um, the surviving homes and we have another one scheduled for next week. Um, we're looking at various ways to reach out and talk to folks um, to continue to get the message out um, as well as continuing to op, um, update the board and the council and also working with the press. Um, that has been helpful um, to really reach out. We've been um, working a lot with um, the Press Democrat in particular to try and continue to get the information out in various ways. We're gonna continue to work with our expert team on um, how we're moving this forward and developing criteria for looking at you know, this initial phase and what, if any, future phases should be to resolve the issue. Um, we're continuing to look at ways that we can expedite anything in relation to resolving this, whether it's expediting service line replacements to um, expediting how we procure and install activated carbon filter systems for the surviving homes. And then um, we're continuing to look at all options for funding and ensuring that we can be in the best position to hopefully be reimbursed. And if you have any questions or folks are needing more information, 
We are always posting updates on our website, and that's srcity.org slash wqadvisory. And if there's questions about rebuild, you can go to sonomacountyrecovers.org. So that's just a, f a, a small snippet flavor of sort of where we're going, and uh, happy to answer any questions and also happy to um, get any feedback from the board. Thank you for the presentation that I think provides some clarity for those of us that are getting questions from the public, so that's great. Um, board Member Dow. I have uh, questions coming from a, quite a few different perspectives. If you looked at that map and the whole area, I lived in that area in three different homes over 22 years and built many homes in that area at my former company. So I have a lot, and I have a lot of friends who happen to live in that area, both people who purchased my company's homes as well as uh, mutual members of Found Grove Golf and Athletic Club. So my questions are somewhat numerous, but um, I think you've answered them, Ms. Burke, but I, I really want to be sure to get clarity on this. So the first question is, is in these outlying areas like Sky Farm, St. Andrews, uh, there are some examples where the contamination reached a level which was not acceptable. And I thought I heard you say those uh, services are either been replaced or are scheduled to be replaced. So that's my first question. And along with that then, um, are we continuing to monitor those as well as their neighbors' uh, services for water quality? So that's the first group of questions that I have. Then when I get into the impacted at advisory area, I also, uh, my company also built some homes in that area. Um, and what I read in this uh, is that the city's going to replace the services to the meter and put in, if uh, necessary, because of occupancy of those areas, uh, a carbon activated filter. What's happening from the carbon activated filter to the house? If there is, is there any contamination? Are we going to continue to be monitoring the water that's actually getting to the yards and to the inside of the house? Um, because it appears to me by reading this that we're not, we're not changing the service uh, on the house side of the carbon filter. So I'd like to get some explanation of that. And then my last question, sorry to bore you all with it, but it appears we're heading in a direction and in somewhat I would have to say hopefully we don't have to change out all the mains. Uh, at the same time, I don't want to leave anything behind that should be taken care of because those carbon activated filters are going to be removed uh, when people start to occupy. So I kind of have like to have a little clarity on that uh, just to be sure. And then my final piece of that question is uh, if we go in this step by step process, are we going to be able to still look to FEMA for possible replacement of steps downstream. So do we get shut off because we said, well, we've changed the service, and then they say, okay, you're done, we're, we're done with you. So those, that's a collection. I'm sorry to go long-winded about it, but it's really important for me, and I suspect the other board members and as well as staff, to really understand what we're doing and what we plan to do, what we're, we're investigating and what we might do in the future so that when we talk to our friends and people of the community, we will have a accurate and common story to be telling them. Thank you. Great, thanks um, board member down. All excellent questions and all things that we've um, thought about and contemplated and um, I am happy to start um, answering those questions and then Director Hornstein might have some um, additional comments to add. So in particular, um, I'll just take them in the order you asked, uh, outside of the advisory area within the burn zone. So yes, you are correct. Um, where we've identified contamination, when we actually are looking at 0.5 parts per billion and above, so actually below even the regulatory limit, of those uh, roughly 2,500 or so service lines that we've sampled, we found 
150 had contamination. So we're replacing those. In some cases, our city crews have already replaced those. Um, and then we've resampled and confirmed that that cleared up the contamination. Um, at your last board meeting, you um, awarded a contract uh, to finish the replacement of those service lines. And so that's gonna be occurring um, in, in the next couple of months. It should be done somewhere by August. Um, and we are continuing to monitor and we are doing a statistically valid resampling of that whole outside service area just to confirm. Plus we're also testing the source water on a routine basis as well. So um, that's what we're doing outside of the service area. And again, um, it has been good news in that it's shown it's cleared up the contamination that we've found. Inside the advisory area, so also a lot of uh, things that we've thought about and talked through in terms of we know um, now that the fire caused it and a lot of the contamination came from the private side melting and getting into our system. So we are gonna be replacing the service lines from the main to actually back of sidewalk. So we're gonna go past just the meter, we're gonna go to back of sidewalk. We're doing that also outside the advisory area. So that's a um, little bit on the private side. Then we're also through the building permit process requiring that folks replace from basically the meter to their home because that's where the contamination is um, a lot of times. And, and you know, we know what's in our system and we've tested on our system, but that is the private side. So we don't really know what happened in terms of we can speculate that because that's the source, it's probably higher on their side. Um, and so we want to folks to know that. So we're requiring where we've seen contamination and we need to replace the service line, we're requiring them to replace it through the building conditioning process, through the building permit process. Where we haven't seen it in the burn area, we're providing language to highly advise folks to replace yes. the, on the property side. So just to add to that, but I think it was well covered, that um, we're using the conservative standard that we developed in terms of replacing service lines outside the advisory area, which is um, 0.5, which is half the way below the MCL limit. And that's where, based on that data of sampling all the properties outside the advisory area, where we got a result above that, we've replaced the service lines. and. In those properties, we are requiring them for the same reasons that we replaced the public side for them to replace the private side as part um, of addressing this issue. In the advisory area, we're taking the approach to replace all the service lines and therefore we'll be requiring everyone to replace the private side, the water lateral going to their homes. Yeah. Um, and I just wanna point out in those areas where we have tested every service line in the burn area and some of them have, have been non-detect, many, most of them have been non-detect. We're simply issuing, issuing a um, informational statement that we highly recommend that they replace their water service line, but it's not a requirement. So we're, we want them to understand that you know, we've had issue, these kinds of issues so that they are at least fully informed in their decision-making process on that. Thank you. Um, and then last uh, questions about, um, you know, um, if, if the phased approach shows and the data confirms that, you know, we've resolved the issue, um, from the water service lines. Um, we do understand and we're hearing um, quite a bit from folks that you know they wanna know that we've resolved the issue. So we are taking a phased approach and we are letting the data guide us and we are, we are looking at ensuring that we can test the system and understand if there's anything sort of left behind because we don't want that to occur. And if it turns out that um, it doesn't resolve the issue, you know, partial replacement or full replacement is still options that are that are there as well. And we have worked very f closely with FEMA and Cal OES and they understand this approach and they're supportive. I, we can't guarantee uh, 
what's going to happen with FEMA because you, you just never know. It's a very um, complicated process, but they do understand the phased approach. They do understand what we're doing, and at least at this point, it, 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 it appears it doesn't close the door um, for you know future phases. They, they understand it's a phased approach and that we'd be submitting future phases as needed. I, I would add, if I could, that um, the phased approach, um, what we've tried to do is, as Ms. Burke noted, is develop it in conjunction with FEMA and have them, you know, as they were looking at the data and asking questions as you would, as you see these graphs dropped, um, do you need to replace the entire system? And they were asking those questions at the same time we began to ask them among ourselves. So we worked with FEMA to develop this strategy with the intent that they would own it and understand that this is the right approach. Um, that there are issues in any approach. One, for example, is there are some out there that are recognizing by a phased approach, if you do have to replace the entire system, haven't you delayed that fix by the time you're taking for the phased approach? The answer is yes, yet by the phased approach, it may be remedied much quicker than two years, right? So it's a bit of a two-sided. There's also some acknowledgement that has um, come to us that in the phased approach and the money you're spending on the service lines, if you do have to replace the entire system, wouldn't much of that work be redundant since it's very difficult and it would be to replace the mains and salvage the new service lines you just put in. And that is something that we are talking with FEMA so they do understand the entire project if we do need to do full replacement, we've just added to the cost burden by this phased approach that they're working with us on. FEMA, um, for a project like this, um, and I don't want to suggest otherwise, um, does not clearly say yes to anything. So they ask questions and they think about it and they sort of kind of give you indication. So that is where we are. So we're far from a place where I could with confidence say they are going to reimburse us for this water quality issue generally in any way, nor necessarily with the process. We're working very hard, in fact, talking about we may couple of us may be going to D.C. next week. So we're working all levels of FEMA and legislative support in our delegation and the like. Board Member Grable. Yeah, I have a, a couple of comments and questions on that. Um, <clears throat> I do understand that <clears throat> the phase approach could could delay things. What, what I'd like to have more of a, you know, maybe consistent and concise message about is that the reasons for those delays are not you know they're they're good reasons that also will i think increase the likelihood that we will be reimbursed because we've gone through this process of due diligence because we've been conservative with you know with that approach um and and minimizing both the the work the timeline and and the potential cost to fema i know the reimbursement process is very um volatile <laughs> and can be long-winded as we saw with Northridge, but I think that that approach, now that we have a temporary solution that is not an impediment to, to occupancy, I think that that, is, that shows uh, due diligence and will, and will increase the likelihood that we're reimbursed. What I don't want is that the, the messaging, the optics on that somehow create uncertainty for people, not just people wanting to rebuild, but I'd also like that outreach to go to realtors. Um, I know we have, uh, you know, uh, board member Battenford and, and others who are involved with the North Bay Association of Realtors. As we see properties changing hands um, and that accelerating, I think it's, it would be great to reach out to as many points of contact 
to get that consistent, clear message because we can't just rely that you know on people reading the paper, people checking their email. I mean, we just have to diversify and and hit every point of contact, including those who may be moving here, or those who may be selling their properties, and that's affecting, you know, the the way that's represented, or you know, the, the potential um, the potential sale price of those properties. I think that's that, that's just something that we can uh, we can help out with a little bit in terms of the clear, accurate messaging. Um, yes, all great points, and we'll definitely incorporate those. And we have been uh, working with and reaching out to the realtors. We've actually gone to a Norbar meeting. We'll be going to another one um, as we sort of roll this out and get additional education. We've also added a number of the Norbar folks to our water quality advisory email list. I do want to mention, you know, at this point, it's it's probably one, one of our most effective communication tools. We have over 10,000 subscribers to that email distribution list. And we're also seeing that when we put things on social media, they're being shared by quite a few folks. So it really does feel that that's been the most effective way that we've communicated. But we are reaching out. We're attending any meetings that we're pretty much asked to go to. We're also reaching out to folks and saying, hey, can we come and, and talk to you as well? So not only um, have we been to Norbar, but we'll be going back. We're also, also looking at the North Coast Builders Exchange and ECA and other uh, groups that would also be rebuilding as well. So we're looking at all, all facets. Perfect, thanks. Vice Chair uh, Arnone. Thank you, kind of following up on the same idea. <clears throat> I have a question about what, what's happening to the water bills for the affected um, area, and I don't ask because I'm wondering whether they're paying or not. I'm asking because that seems like a logical vector for s pushing information that is customized to individual properties uh, to people who may not be tuning in to all the other kinds of outreach that you're doing. So if they are one of the 13 surviving homes, their water bill is being credited, um, and they're still having to pay the sewer. If their property has been destroyed, those bills were um, ceased um, immediately in October. So they got final bills and they won't be getting bills until they reestablish service. And so we're not able to use that as a mechanism for pushing information then because we stopped billing? I mean, I guess the question I, is, can we use that, our billing process to push information out? Um, we, we, yeah, we can definitely look at um, using the bills to put, put information out in that way. We do, uh, we will be there will be, inf so our water annual water quality report is coming out and we'll be putting that information out through the water bills. I think it's already going. Um, and so that's a mechanism that we're using, but that's a great idea. We'll look into those opportunities to get messaging out that way as well. And I, I think consistent with the, the challenge of so many bills now are not going out, that may be also added to our long-term strategy. There's gonna be ongoing you know, attention to this issue and interest, and as it does get rebuilt and repopulated, that, that probably then will be a more targeted way to get the information out long term to keep the communication line going on. Of course, we're going to continue to sample for years more than we typically would, and that will be a really good mechanism once we get some population back in the area. Board Member Watts. For the 13 standing homes, are their private service lines going to need to be replaced? So that's a good question. Um, we have, for those that have asked, and we've offered to all of them that we would take inside samples. Um, um, and it's like at a kitchen sink, bathroom sink, hose bib. To date, the ones we've taken, the results have come back, except for the, the sort of one on Tall Pine where it was a hose bib. Um, either non I mean, they've all come back underneath the MCL um, and in, in most cases have been true non-detect. So it doesn't appear that that's really an issue, but we're always willing and offering to sample for folks and um, uh, sort of a one-time inside to see if there's an issue. It, it, it's a good question because um, th that's a slight inconsistency in what we had noted that our approach is requiring the um, water lateral from the meter to be to the home to be replaced everywhere we've decided to replace for because of the data and protection the public portion of the service lines the reason 
we are not <coughs> requiring, although supporting sampling, as you heard, requiring replacement is those properties did not have the burn. So we're being um, cautious and conservative as we've tried to be in this whole affair in terms of replacing their service line and they're feeling that's a good thing, but not imposing a requirement uniquely on them because those homes didn't burn, but availing if they do want us to support sampling to confirm that they aren't seeing contamination. And I have another question regarding, um, does the city have a public information officer that's handling the media and of, across all departments or is internally, are we having to handle that on our own? Um, it, it's a bit of both. We, we do have a very strong public information group within the water department. Elise Howard yeah. just does a great job. Um, this issue is certainly a citywide issue in the city's new public information officer, Adrian Mertens, um, is engaged and involved in all aspects of the messaging and supporting um, a citywide consistency because there are meetings that water staff don't go to and there are other messaging that's going out citywide. So we, you know, there's PED, there's a lot of communication occurring. So uh, yes, it, it's a bit of both, but we are trying to have a citywide approach as well. Other questions? The only other thing that I would uh, mention, and I'm sure it's part of the messaging, is I, I think it's important that the public understand that the opportunities for some of these homeowners to get the activated carbon filters is a temporary fix. It is not a permanent fix. And I think we need to make sure that's clear in our message. Board Member Dowd. <coughs> This is not meant by any stretch of the imagination criticism, but out of staff and, and the way this has evolved, but I think I have been inadvertently a part of the problem and miscommunication as I've talked to friends because <coughs> when I <coughs> first heard of the activated carbon filters at one of our study sessions that we had, it was my understanding that those carbon filters were to be put on the water services as a means of providing safety for people who still lived in their 13 homes in the advisory area and to allow construction of new homes uh, and the water that was then going to those homes would be safe for the purposes needed therefore. And now I'm hearing that our Replacement of the services may in fact solve the problem. The carbon filters then will be taken out as Chairman uh, Galvin just stated. Uh, and we will not now have to change, we may not have to replace uh, all of the mains. And so I have told people that the carbon filters were gonna go in temporary for the purposes I just stated and then we will commence replacing the main. That was my understanding about a month ago. So what I would really encourage us to do is to put that kind of information into our message so homeowners know we just didn't cop out on them, but that our research showed us that this may solve the problem and it will make it safe to live in these houses and if we get further information then the city still uh, will consider the replacement of the mains, however you want to express it. But this has been an evolving issue, and I think we need to say that's what it's been, and we're trying to get this to be the best solution for everyone. And I, I would just offer that um, you certainly are not alone with that understanding, and um, we've tried to say if needed as necessary, um, but that gets lost and we're, we, we need to reinforce that certainly going forward. And then there's the other piece that will probably play out in certain ways of um, where we did install them. Um, no, I want to keep them. No, it's time to take them. That kind of thing is likely to play out in some way as well. And I would just add that um, 
the carbon filtration piece was really something that we felt a need to, um, you know, as we've discussed previously, um, get clarity on the ability to utilize it um, to answer the question of rebuild. Um, folks were at a, an important juncture, as you recall, about if I start rebuilding, am I going to be able to occupy my home when it's complete? And so that was an, an immediate response that we felt we needed to be able to provide. And we so we had to have some solutions, even though we didn't know whether we were going to need the solutions at that point in time. So we had to kind of have a solution for that question now and continue to work on the problem as we have been. Any other board member questions? Very good. Thanks for the update, and I know we'll continue to get them. So um, we'll look forward to further updates on the messaging and go from there. Thank you. We So we have no consent items. We have uh, one report item, item 7.1, which is the contract award. Thank you, Chairman Gavin, Gavin and board members for convening today for this special meeting. My name is Jillian Tillis, and I'm an Associate Civil Engineer with Transportation and Public Works. We're here to review the scope of work for contract number 2222, replacement of the water services affected by the Tubbs fire inside the advisory area. And to award the contract to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Terracon Constructors, Inc. Um, Ms. Tills, could I ask you to get a little closer to the microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer did a really great job going over the background, and um, I really, uh, I don't know how much I have to add. Uh, but by using the phased approach, the city is looking to accelerate the restoration of the water quality in the advisory area. Um, We are going to, uh, this is the area, um, the advisory area. Our, as we discussed, uh, public outreach is one of our highest priorities right now. And uh, at, we have been coordinating our efforts with the water department and contacting homeowners through mailings, websites, social media postings. Um, since the press release last Thursday, I have begun receiving inquiries and questions from homeowner, homeowners and I have been coordinating those responses with, with uh, Ms. Burke, Ms. Urbanic, and Ms. Howard. Um, after the water service lines are replaced and flushed, uh, the area will be retested, and um, we look forward to seeing the testing under normal conditions. Uh, our team will also be working closely with the water department to coordinate the shutdowns and the flushing uh, during those shutdowns. Uh, so we're replacing the water service lines to 352 parcels. However, we estimate that there are 368 service lines that were damaged. All service lines will be replaced with one inch polyvinyl copper tubing. We'll have a new saddle at the main. All manifold services will be replaced with two single water service lines. All of this work will be performed by um, open trench installation. Uh, we will not be doing um, pipe bursting or pulling the line. Um, we will also be replacing the permanent blow-offs. Uh, we're starting with 15, but there is up to 27 blow-offs within the advisory area. Uh, we'll be removing the sidewalk. We'll be replacing the water meter boxes and we'll be installing a stub out 12 inches behind the sidewalk for future connection. In the Fountain Grove area, um, the majority of this work will be taking place inside the public utility easement and we won't actually be going onto their property. Um, 
And then we'll be doing uh, permanent trench paving uh, in, in anticipation of the truck traffic that will be continuing uh, over the next two years and through the rebuild process. The project was advertised on May 4th, 2018. We opened bids on May 21st, 2018. We received a total of seven bids ranging from 2.3 million to 4.7 million. The low bid was 18.25% under the engineer's estimate, and Terracon Constructors, Inc. of Healdsburg, California was the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. It is recommended that the Board of Public Utilities, by motion, approve the project and award the construction contract number CO2222 in the amount of $2,305,732 to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and approve a 10% contingency, contingency thus authorizing a total contract amount of $2,536,305.20. Um, thank you and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Board Member Dowd. I have two comments. First, I want to go back um, to it, it says uh, on this page, and I can't tell by this, I think it's page four, but I'm not positive, where it's, it's the bullet item that says installing activated carbon water filters at the surviving homes. Um, I think that that step should say, and to assist in uh, the ability to move into homes that are being rebuilt, they would, those activated carbon filters will be added. So I think we need to be clear about that, that that's an option that's out there that the, will, the city is willing to be a part of. And then I'll go to the page 7-7. Seven, seven, and I personally would recommend, because if you look at the bid spread, there's a huge disparity between bidders, and I would certainly support a contingency in the neighborhood of 20% rather than just 10%. Obviously, staff would be making the decisions as to whether it was necessary, but I think we're going to find a lot of changes necessary out there. So. Uh, at any rate, that's, uh, that's my comment, is that I, I would like to give you a little more latitude uh, so that we keep this thing moving along rather than a need to come back to the board for approval. So that's my recommendation. Um, on your first comment, I think um, your edits do reflect um, the accurate intent of where we're going and we should make these edits prior to posting on the website or correct the posting accordingly. Thank you for that. And um, Ms. Urbanic uh, concurs with your assessment of what we're likely to see in this project going forward. So um, your suggestion does um, work for staff. Any other board member? Yeah, board member uh, Mullen. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions relative to the uh, service replacement. The, the polyvinyl copper tubing that we're using, is this the current city standard for service laterals? Or was this part of our research towards a solution for this particular problem? Um, the, the current standard is HDPE. Uh, however, given uh, or polyvinyl. So, so it the is current part of standard, standard. It, yes. Okay. So, and the reason I ask that is that in our public information outreach, I would hope that we uh, include information that we believe this is the best service materials to replace the, this, as well as doing our corrective action to solve the problem. But this uh, is is part of our public information outreach, so that we. Uh, again, this is a really tough thing for people to wrap their head around. Uh, our drinking water, a safe, reliable drinking supply is something that we all uh, think is very important. If you have young children, 
uh, you're moving back in, you have other issues to worry about is the safety of the water. So uh, the fact that we're using materials that we believe not are just going to so solve this problem, but provide a long-term solution, I would hope that gets wrapped into our public information outreach. Thank you. I think that's a um, great suggestion, and I just wanted to add a bit of clarity that maybe you all recognize that um, it is a copper tubing. The water will just be exposed to the copper. The polyvinyl is a coating on that, and that's simply for corrosion protection. Any other board member questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Well, I, I would uh, support the recommendation that's put before us on page 77, but would increase the contingency amount to 20%. I'll second it with a caveat of asking council whether or not that would violate any of our existing um, code requirements or building regulations to increase the amount of the contingency for an individual contract. Or the fact that the notice probably referenced 10% contingency when the bidders bid the project. Right. Well, the, the contingency amount is um, a city policy um, to allow um, our staff as things progress through these projects um, to, to have some latitude for unexpected circumstances and changes that may occur. Um, I think we have the latitude to increase the contingency amount. It's not a bid item. It's just something that the city wants to include in the contract to um, cover those unexpected costs. So I think it's it's fine for us to proceed on that basis. That makes that makes my second unconditional. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a uh, motion by board member Dowd, seconded by Vice Chair Arnone. Is there any further questions or discussion? Board member Watts. What would the total amount be with the 20%? And the only, the only reason why I ask is that is it close to some of the other amounts that were um, that of the other bids? And if it is, would that have changed the decision to go with this um, particular bid? The, the contingency amount is, um, like I said, the city's practice is to include 15% to cover unexpected costs. That doesn't impact any of the bids amounts that were received. So any of the bid amounts, we take that bid amount and that's the contract and then we add 15% to kind of give us some latitude on the ground for unexpected changes. Um, so it, it doesn't impact, um, it, it, any, any bid amount um, would have that additional contingency. It's just now we're doing a 20% to give us a, a greater latitude to, and, um, to pay for unanticipated changes on the ground. Right. I, I think that's a key point, that the use of the contingency, unlike the bid amount, is not money that will necessarily go to the contractor. The, the use of the contingency will be based solely on staff determination that there were change conditions or something else independent of the basis of the bid. So generally, a contractor would not look at whatever contingency is as part of the money they're going to be receiving and how they would bid the job because that's going to be staff determination whether or not any of it will ever reach the contractor. No, I, I, under, I understand what the contingency means. I, I, that wasn't exactly my question, but I think somewhere someone answered it anyway. So. To go back to that first part of your question, the with a 20% contingency, it's about 2.75 million. Any other board member questions or comments? If not, I'll call for the question. All in favor of the motion, including the 20% contingency, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we have uh, one missing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any public comments on non-agenda matters? Seeing no one rise, we have no referrals, no re written communications, any subcommittee reports? 
Hearing none, any board member reports? Hearing none, any director's reports? Um, I, I don't have any items today, although I did want to um, thank the board, share staff's appreciation for you accommodating um, the schedule, this special meeting. It, it does give us two weeks jump on starting this work, which feels very important. And we, we did greatly benefit from the feedback on the first item in terms of framing our ongoing communication. So thank you for that. Board Member Dowd? I, I did want to say, as under board member reports, I did let Chairman Galvin know and Director Horenstein that I will not be in uh, able to attend the, I think it's June 6th meeting or whatever that next first meeting in June is. Very good. Any further? We stand adjourned. Thank you all for being here. And again, thanks to the board for making the effort to uh, attend this special meeting.